Hi again, Mark here from Talking Bass. This week, I'm sitting down to talk bass with the awesome player and wonderful human being, Todd Johnson. Todd is both a bass innovator and hugely popular bass educator. He's a popular jazz bass performer as both sideman and solo artist, and he's developed a wonderful style of playing both chords and bass lines simultaneously on his six string bass. Many of you might also know him through his use of the floating thumb technique, which he developed from his studies with Gary Willis, and he now teaches that in a very systemized and accessible way alongside all of his other educational methods. So let's sit down with Todd and get into some talking bass. Todd Johnson, I have got three main things that I kind of know you for. So one of them is obviously floating thumb technique, which we'll talk about later on. Um, bass lines and chords that are chordal, chords with bass lines, I think you'd probably call it. Okay. And bass education, which is, you know, a real big thing for me, you know, because I've seen so much of you with that. Um, so going just back a little so you know like you've got a lot of this thing going on with like chords and bass lines and all this and a lot of the harmony thing that you do did you play anything before you played bass were you a guitarist did you play keys anything like that uh as a kid i uh the folks got me a, a little guitar and i took some lessons and uh, you know my mom would drive me to guitar lessons and and bring me a snack. And I, I was lucky. My parents were awesome, very supportive. And then in high school, in uh, grade school, played the trumpet, uh, played the guitar on the side, just singing Peter, Paul, and Mary songs, Puff right. and Magic Dragon, Bye Bye Miss American Pie. I remember learning that. You know, it was yeah. like, cool. Mr. Tambourine Man. Yeah. And uh, uh, high school, I switched, I uh, got braces and switched from trumpet to tuba. Had no idea that all the exercises I learned on the trumpet that they were hard to play on the tuba. So mm -hmm. I just did it. I was yeah. kind of self-taught. I learned how to read bass clef. We didn't have a tuba instructor, but I couldn't play trumpet because of the braces. And I wound up making all state, uh, uh, all Northwest, all the, I made all these like huge bands and only been playing the tuba six months. I could barely <laughs> read bass clef. I can read treble clef quite well. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, just learn to read bass clef and, and, and it was funny. I remember going to uh, Washington State University had a, an honors camp, and they only invited certain, you know, band kids up for this thing. And I, and I remember uh, playing for them, and they said, well, play us a piece. And so I played, you just stuff that's not a big deal on trumpet. But they looked at me like I was nuts because nobody played that played that yeah, on the yeah, tuba, yeah. you know, coming from a, a small farm town where I grew up. So so and, and I just didn't know any better. So and so that was interesting. At uh, college, I switched to I, I mean, I, I, I actually picked up the I got my first bass guitar when I was 16 and we played in it. We had a stage band. Yeah. yeah. Not, not jazz band, stage band. That, that's yeah. how old I am. And then when I went to college, I played tuba. Uh, I switched to uh, mostly upright bass and still played electric bass. And just, I just played with anybody that would let me. And I'm, and I wind up in Las Vegas, fast forward about 10 years and, and I'm there and I wanted to get back to playing upright and I was playing electric bass and pop bands cause I could make a living doing that. Right. Um, I wasn't a good enough jazz player, even though I, that's what I studied in college. I just needed more time to, I mean, I could play the odd jazz gig or the cocktail set and not embarrass mm -hmm. myself, but not enough to where I could get hired for those gigs and yeah. eat. So, so uh, uh, at a certain point I got back into the upright and, and I really enjoyed that, but I'd be in Vegas for six weeks and I'd be on the road for a month and I couldn't bring my upright with me. And I just got tired of having to rebuild my chops and rebuild my chops. So uh, when I, Let's see, 89, 90, 1990, I moved to LA. I, I walked away from Las Vegas 
and went back to, went decided I was going to go back to school. I was so frustrated musically. I couldn't stand it. And so I knew I needed more information. So when I got to, to BIT and I'm studying with Gary Willis and Steve Bailey and Jeff Berlin and all the superstar guys yeah. that were there. And, and at a certain point I realized I got this upright that I'm okay at and I'm pretty, I'm better on the electric bass, but if I'm going to be good at it, I need to be good at one thing. And I thought, this is really my voice. That's where I felt had the most potential for me. I love the upright. I've transcribed it. I worship so many upright players. So at that point, I put the five string in the case. I, 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 so, I sold everything but my six string. It's just yeah. like I burned all my bridges in a sense. So uh, there was no going back. Um, um, <laughs> and I decided I was going to learn to play the six string. And then studying with the people that I studied with and, and, and getting a hang and the influences I got, I just – I just decided I was going to sink or swim with that instrument. Um, really, here, I just happen to have a bass here. Uh, <laughs> when, I, when I picked up my first six string, right? because I was playing five string at the time, when I picked up my first uh, uh, six string, I remember being in the, the LA Bass Exchange down on Ventura Boulevard. Great place. And they had six strings. And I remember picking up going, well, you can play a low C here and a – you could play – and I, and I hear that hole in the middle and I'm thinking, I don't know how to do it. I have no idea what I'm doing, what I'm looking at, but I know it's possible to play bass and chords. Yeah. You know, you, I knew, Oh, now that's <laughs> all that kind of stuff was all there available. I just didn't know how to access it. And it, it was almost like whew, I'm on a path. Yeah, and I I had blinders on, and I was just I was just <laughs> brilliant enough or stupid enough to pursue it. Depends on how depends on how you look at it. Wow. And uh, um, <clears throat> when I was at uh, uh, BIT as a student, Ron Eshtay, great great jazz guitar player, yeah, yeah. everybody, and uh, he kind of took a shine to me because I'd go into his his open counseling sessions and I'd play bass for him and all these guitar players, you know, yeah. and. Uh, and I went in there with my tape recorder, a real book, and a pencil because Ron played all the real changes, not the just the stuff that's in the book. Yeah, and yeah. he'd show me that, or I'd figure it out, and I'd write it down, and I'm taping everything. And so he went, this guy's into this. So he, he, he kind of pulled me aside one day into, into his office and, uh, and said, hey, I got an assignment for you. He said, and I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like a, <laughs> I'm like a dog wanting a treat. Yeah. And so he said, could, do you think you could, you could play me a, a third and a seventh of an F7 chord and, a, and, and keep a bass line going and keep me just, just thirds and sevenths would be enough and, and be able to play me an F blues. <laughs> he said, go home and work on that and I'll see you on Monday. Come in and let me show, show me what you got. So I went home. So I thought, well, I got F. I got, I got the third and the seventh and I got a root here. And, and that sounds better than this thing that's that's like okay. a weird bad ukulele voicing or something it's too <laughs> close because it, the root's too high up in the voice but mm -hmm. this this has enough separation so yeah. i thought if i do that see b flats right there and and that moves here so i literally started off going yep and i did that till cuz it's like you know yeah, doing yeah. that thing and then you build up. Or start off with half notes. And, and I just slowly built that up. And I, I worked out a few things where I could play a blues. And I came in and showed him. And he was like, this kid's so stupid. He'll actually go home and work on this. You know? <laughs> and I did. And I kept working at it. And he should give me a few pointers. Maybe invert it or flip something around, and and then just shove me in, and I was I was hooked. And then about three or four months later, he called me on a gig. One of my teachers, the great Putter Smith, uh, was working with him regularly every Friday, Saturday at a little place down in Ventura Boulevard called the Diamonds Pool. Are Forever. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Mr. Kid, Mr. Went. Yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We used to have parties and watch that. You know? <laughs> Butter, every time you come on. Uh, uh, and he's a dear man and a master musician. Um, yeah. 
Um, and, and so putter was, was out. I think he was playing with Diane sure or somebody like that. So, so, uh, Ronnie hired me and I did good enough. He kept calling me and I kept coming back and, uh, uh, and I just, I just hung on and I just hung on and I recorded everything for about the first year because I thought for sure, well, this weekend will be my last. And then he's been <laughs> calling me again. And we've been playing together since, you know. Wow. Uh, we played together regularly, uh, like every week yeah. for 22 years when I lived in Los Angeles. Now, I haven't played with him in two years because I live in Phoenix and he lives there. And it's just, uh, but, yeah. but we talk on the phone and give each other a hard time. And he's my <laughs> dear, dear friend and my mentor. Um, but that's where it started. So, I mean, I learned G, C, and D, and A minor, and E minor. You know, I learned some of the basic cowboy chords on guitar. Um, I learned just enough music theory and ear straining or ear training in, in school <laughs> where I knew I had good fundamentals. And, and all of a sudden, I could put that together. And, and that's how I figured out how to do all this was, mm. so now, well, if I got... This third and seventh, I know it's going to go, that goes down a half step. That's my seventh and third. And then to make that C minor, there's my C. There's my F. There's my B flat. And then it was just in D7 and G minor. C7. Looking for nice voice leading. Yeah, yeah. Just try to, try, and, and, oh, wow, okay. And you, and then over time, you find some of the little shortcuts. Sometimes I'll play a major six instead of a major seven same flavor yeah but easier to play sometimes sometimes you go no that's the sound that i want i want that rub but anyway and they're all there on the sixth string i mean that's the great thing with the instrument isn't it well really? they're they're there on the other so they just don't sound good because everything's yeah. too close and yeah. too dark and the timbre's not yeah. right so so uh so then once you once i could uh <laughs> you know, it, 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 that that took a while to build up to all that. Then all of a sudden, Latin music came by, where you're playing, yeah, and, and getting that 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 thing going in this hand. Yeah. Holy crap! So that was fun. So now I I, I I developed that. Then playing with students in lessons. Now this is before we had iPads and iPhones and iReal Pro and Band in the Box and all that kind of stuff. So it's like we, we might have had a, a a metronome. Yeah. But we'd set a metronome on two and four, you know, kind of thing. Or yeah. if there was a drum machine, the swing stuff always sucked. It always yeah. does on drum machines. But so we'd have a two and four and they'd play their bass line and I started going, uh and then next thing you know, I'm I'm going, well, I, I should learn a melody. I'm just practicing while they're working on their their bass play. So uh you know, and you learn to start putting together melodies and you work stuff out and you go, yeah. oh yeah. And you start, and I worked that stuff up a bite at a time and started getting into more chord melody and started going, oh, I know these voicings. I know I should learn all these other voicings and started started taking the old uh, major scale, uh, C major with the root on top, with yeah. the ninth on top, with the third, with the fifth, all those kind of things and put those together and, and then... Uh, you know, one of my students asked me the other day, he says, I really want to learn how to hear chord changes better. I said, well, let's learn how to play them. Because yes. it's hard to learn that and learn voicings until you start playing them all the time. I keep saying that all the time when people want to learn ear training and stuff. And for bass players especially, you know, because we don't play keyboard. Well, I mean, we might. I mean, I started out with keys. But it's like, you know, for your average bass player that's only played bass, and you try telling them about even a minor seven chord. And, uh, uh, I mean, they, they don't know what it sounds like. Yeah. They can find the root. They can hear the root, but I found the C. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's interesting to ask students, well, what chord is that? And they go C. And I say, C what? And they go, 
Or, <laughs> or they just they just guess, and and, and it's yeah. not their fault. They just don't know. I was yeah. that way for many years. Yeah, yeah. Or I or I I knew it had a major third in it because that sounded yeah. good. That minor third didn't sound good in there. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, I didn't know about that seventh or that ninth or that sharp eleven or whatever. You know, theory can be really dry and yeah. really boring. Ear training can just be torturous. So we call it harmony and tyranny. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, there, I remember the college theory, and it was just so oh, figured base and eh, yeah. this stuff they did through it. This is not going to help me on reading a big band gig or doing a casual or anything. It's just especially very different. traditional classical. Um, yeah. Harmony. So once I got into jazz theory, I, I, I've always liked that the Musicians Institute has a book called Harmony and Theory. Pretty innovative title there, but it's just <laughs> and it's nuts and bolts theory. And I and I've been taking guys through that because I taught that class for a long time. Yeah. And uh, it's just nuts and bolts. It's not rocket science, but you learn the fundamentals. And with that, that's the building blocks that you can build some music. I finally got started to see it as a filing system for mm -hmm. how music works. It's yeah. a filing system. So if you want to learn how music works, that's the key. If you just go, I'm just going to learn this song and these notes. Okay, you can do that. But then you have to start all over again when you go to the next song and those, that order of those notes. If yeah. you learn theory, you learn that filing system and those templates that you go, oh, this is just this. This is just one, four, three, six, two, five, one. Yeah. I can play it in any key, plug it in. Oh, people go, how do you, how can you learn a thousand standards? Well, by numbers and distance. Yeah. Oh, you know, some people do soulfish. That's great. I never learned it, but I, I always learn it as uh, uh, numbers. My reason being, I, I never had a A minor fa chord i always had yeah, a yeah. chord so so but but i'm just but i know soulfish is brilliant i'm just not good at it but anyway so so learning to to take those tunes and and learning the a little bit of theory a little practicality in there and you can you can transpose tunes on the fly and oh my goodness that coupled with a, organizing the fingerboard you know learning the major scale from your second finger your fourth finger and your first yeah. one at a time, not all three at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Learn major, minor, and dominant, those three ways. All of a sudden the whole, this whole thing connects. Now I have a filing system for, for fingerings. I have a filing system for how music works. Oh my gosh, this is really useful. Imagine our computers that were, it's so amazing that we're talking like this. I mean, this is cool. This is like space age stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, imagine having our computers with just every file on yeah. top of the desktop. Yeah. Without a filing system, this thing is chaos. Yeah. Well, music can seem like chaos without that filing system. So I would encourage everyone, don't just do theory and not practice your butt off and keep learning songs. It's a way to make songs transferable yeah. and useful and you start to see all the commonality involved from song to song to song. <laughs> Now, in terms of the instrument and uh, technique, you're pretty much a pioneer when it comes to floating thumb technique. Now, um, we had a little bit of a chat about this just before we uh, came on air, and I'm just one of those guys that I, I do it a little bit, and mainly through your... Um, watching you do it and looking at it because you've got a brilliant there's a there's a video on uh, online on youtube i think that where you're giving a really in-depth view of it where it's like moving the mechanism and all that and when i saw that it all just clicked i was like ah yeah because i was trying to i was kind of thinking well actually before we go on <laughs> if you want to just give an, uh, a, a little breakdown of what floating thumb technique is because otherwise <laughs> they wonder what i'm talking about full full disclosure here I learned this from Gary Willis. This is not my invention. I learned this from him. I don't know if he invented it. I kind of suspect he did. I don't think he cares whether he invented it or not. He figured yeah. it out and, and refined it beyond comprehension. Gary, if you're new to the base, go see Gary's floating thumb. He uses th these three fingers. Okay. 
and and and, and you you set the 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 thumb on the strings. It, it it's not levitating. It it, it 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 has to touch the string in order to stop the sympathetic vibrations. Okay. Now Gary has a thing where it's two fingers and he keeps a third finger on the string above what you're playing most of the time and plays some notes with this third finger. Third fingers, not all, but a chunk of it's just mainly for muting. Yeah. Um, when I studied with Gary, um, I tried, uh, I mentioned this, we talked about this before. I tried, I tried for three months to learn the note, note, shift, reset, note, note, shift, reset, that whole thing. And I worked for three months and I could barely play a major scale. Ba, da, da. And it's just like, oh man. And I was gigging and I, I just couldn't. I, I, so I adapted the best I could two fingers in the right hand. And, and that got rid of most, the biggest chunk. And every once in a while, I'll have a, a string above ringing. And usually I can sneak, I've, I, I've learned mostly how to compensate with the left hand. Yeah. So, but full disclosure, go study Gary Willis. If you're just getting into this. Okay. Uh, but anyway, here's my take on it. If you, if you set, think about this. If your hands relax, look what that thumb wants to do. It doesn't want to do that. Now, if you do this and your hands relax and that's relaxed for you. Awesome. It's about ergonomics. Yeah, and, yeah. and you mentioned you kind of do a movable anchor thing. Awesome. That's great. The, but what you're doing, we're both talk, we're talking about the same thing. It's like parsing semantics or something. Yeah, it, yeah. If you do this, you're keeping your thumb in contact and you're muting here with the, the heel of the hand and the, the uh, it's just the bottom of the thumb. Yeah, that kind of bit there. Yeah, whatever you call that. This, yeah. this part. <laughs> and, and as long as that's touching the strings, you're in good shape. Yeah. That'll keep it from ringing. Um, so if you do this, awesome. If you do this, great. My, as much as I can, I like being relaxed. Okay. This, uh, uh, just a, a, a quick kind of lesson here. Large muscle group, small two cent part in the wrist called the carpal tunnel. Yeah. Bass players, and again, you will see brilliant guys play this way. So don't go around telling them they're not doing something right or Todd <laughs> Johnson thinks you suck or anything. Okay. Uh, please don't do that. Okay. But if you have a ringing string problem, then, then consider this at least for chunks of what you play. Uh, we tend to anchor our thumb on our B or E string, whichever we have. And we tend to, well, I don't want my shoulder to get tired, so I'm going to bend my wrist. Yeah. Give my shoulder the day off, and I do this. Now, does that look right to you? Mm. Yeah, if this was a garden hose, what would we be doing? We'd be restricting the flow of water. Well, if we did this, okay, the flow goes well. So it's Good analogy, that, yeah. Well, and, 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 and if you're having wrist problems, take a look at that. Yeah. Now, again, we give this large muscle group that perfectly designed by God to support all of this. We give it the day off and put all the pressure on this two cent part. We're persistent. Sometimes we're just not very smart. And I did it for years. Okay. So, so if you can use just enough of this shoulder to support this and, and the arm, sorry, it's kind of hard to see with this black wristband. I just try to keep my sweaty stuff off the expensive instrument. <laughs> Uh, it sits, you notice the forearm is kind of shaped like that, mm. kind of like this contour here on the, yeah, yeah. go, th go figure. It's good design. So it, it's this kind of business and I'm using just enough of the shoulder to keep the elbow from dropping. I'm not, I'm not sticking it above and off the body because that guys come to me and go, this floating thumb killed my shoulder. Well, but you're not doing it correctly. Just let it sit there. And there's a point where you can let it relax. And then there's a point where you drop it and look what it, look what it did. If I do this and I got just enough to keep my arm here and straight and my thumb muting all these strings. Now, it, if, if I drop my elbow and let it relax too much, 
You see that little bit of room that came off the B and E string yeah, yeah. and guys come to me and they're like this and they got ring and strings all over the place. And I go, we got to fix that. And they go, well, I'm doing the floating thumb. Well, you're doing part of the floating thumb, but you're dropping the shirt. So that's a real common thing. Guys will get this right. And they're real close. And the last part is like, Oh, it's got a touch. And it's about the elbow and how much of this shoulder to use to support it. And, yeah. and, once you get that, then it's like, well, this was designed to do that. If you've not done it, I mean, it's like going to the gym for the first time in a long time. It might be a little stiff and slightly different, but this is designed to support all of this. Yeah. This is not. And you're asking, I mean, if you don't, if you play that way and you're happy and you don't have any pain, then, then God bless you, you know, but, and so don't, don't wish me, cancer and stuff because I, I don't <laughs> I don't promote the way you play. I've had people do that. It's crazy. Oh anyway, my god. So, so 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 if you if you notice a ringing string problem, well, let me show you something here. So I hope this isn't doesn't overdrive anything, but if I if I anchor on my pickup mm -hmm. and, and and I just play this this uh this D string <laughs> Can you hear that? Yeah. It's like this. It's like it's like a bad Walking Dead soundtrack thing. Yeah. It's the... You'll get the. Okay, here, the and it goes away. I'm One so hypersensitive to it, you know. Yeah. Now I remember, and I and I I actually remembered something, um, and I, I asked you to remind me. But when I was studying with Gary, I I was Mr. Anchor. And I would anchor on the pickup or the E string, and I would and I played too hard and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and if you play hard, God bless you. But I, I just wanted to develop more than that. Um, anyway, I'm playing, and I'm up here going, and and I got all this ringing stuff going. And I don't hear it. Willis is sitting off here to my right, and every time it would start ringing, he'd just reach over and go. <laughs> and put a couple fingers like right there and I'd go like this and it kind of it startle you you know and then we go back to playing and a few bars later he's he's doing this and he just kept doing that till I finally heard it and when I heard it one it was exhilarating and really depressing and you can't not hear it then <laughs> yeah once you hear it it's like oh crap and then I when you're loud I didn't even know it <laughs> And when you're loud on stage, it's 20 times worse because you can really hear it. Well, and, and in fairness to us deaf old bass players, <laughs> when we're playing on stage with drums and ringy cymbals and guitar players that frankly have ring and strings a lot, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's hard, it, it can be disorienting. Look, it must be those guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Couldn't be me. Oh, it is me. And, and I, I remember... I, I have a free video. If you go Todd Johnson floating thumb on YouTube, it's free. It's a whole thing. Um, I'm going to refilm all that. Cause it was, I did all that before HD. That's how old I am. Um, yeah. uh, I'm going to, and I'm going to put some things up, some fundamentals and I'm just going to make them free to everybody. Okay. Um, but you can get that and take a stab at that. If you have questions, you can email me Todd at Todd Johnson music.com. You probably provide a link. I imagine yeah, that yeah, that'll be there. Uh, uh, I'd be thrilled to help you with it. Any of that stuff, Mark can help you with it. I, st I went to BIT. I'd been there six months. I, I left Las Vegas. I left a house gig at Caesar's palace. Yeah. A lot of people thought I was crazy. And I was like, no, the smart people said, get out of here, go learn the next level of stuff and, and move on, up. get out of here. And it was the best thing I ever did. But I came back to, to do, you know, like during Christmas break or something to like uh, uh, play a, a few good paying gigs. And I went back to town and I went around and I sat in with a bunch of the bands that I used to play with playing the same song, same bass lines, you know, uh, you know, uh, play that funky music. White boy doesn't change just because you go to college, you know, you play it. Yeah. But I came back and played with everybody and overwhelmingly everybody said, wow, you always played really well, but everything you play now is so clean. Yeah. And it was like, it went from playing the part correctly and having that ringy stuff and the note durations in various, they were inconsistent. I'll just say it that way to making those more consistent and cleaning up this stuff. It was like, rather than this kind of bass on, it went to ooh, yeah. tighten it up. And, and, and all of a sudden 
the drummers to themselves, they sound better playing with you now than they did yeah, before yeah. because they didn't know whether it was you or it was their symbols or what. And, and so I would encourage everybody to take that real, you don't have to play a gazillion notes. You just play it cleaner and get rid of that extraneous noise and the buzzy farty stuff play next to the frit. And it's amazing how it can clean up your, everything your just life. gets tightened up. And yeah. I, I didn't notice it as much until I started playing five. Uh, Cause I, like I said, I'm a four stringer at heart, but, playing five string for gigs because I was, because I didn't start on five or I'd not been playing it for years. And you, you know, you, you kind of develop this, you know, this muscle memory when you start playing on something. I didn't have that. I was just coming into it and it was really, really apparent to me that there was all this noise coming out on, you know, and it's always on the, like the A string in between as you're playing up on these things. And I'm like, Oh, how am I supposed to cut that off? And I'm trying everything, you know, because you, 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 you know, when it's doing, even if you can't hear it, you know, you kind of almost get a, a sixth sense for which fingers are, are, are locking down which strings. And I just knew that string was ringing. And every time, and then when you put your finger on it, you can kind of almost feel it. You can kind of feel that it was ringing before. And I'm like, no. And I just didn't know. I, I knew about, I'd already seen Gary, uh, Gary's, uh, one of his videos back in the, you know, like one of the men, videos that he did back in the early 90s and i'd seen that but i'd never taken that much notice of it but then all of a sudden i'm like man i need to sort this out and it was through you that i started looking at the uh i mean this is way back but i was finding out about the floating thumb technique and you know i don't use it as much on four but i definitely use it on five especially if i'm playing something low down but the one thing that i've always wanted to ask you is i'm fine with it if i'm just playing regular bass lines especially stepwise things so if i'm playing you know anything scalar or, or low down or anything but if i have to play jumps like big leaps i always find that's where i find it tricky like you know like if i'm playing like tenths things like that and i'm having to move across what have you got any solutions for that that, that work there's two ways you can abandon it and, and just and just play it and and, and it's probably fine because your left hand will help out the other is to move the mechanism so, right. so if you, and, 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 and I'll, you notice, you notice my, my, my hands moving. Yeah. And so you, you get to where you're, you, you can move that. Uh, yeah. And, I, and so it's learning to make those little those little moving that mechanism, those little rather than doing this may be overstating the case. There's logic to it. How practical it is depends, depends upon the, the individual. But I've always looked at it. If I anchor here and I play this string, I have a particular range of motion. If I play this, the A string, I have a, another, range of motion i have a different range of motion a different range of motion and you, you see the difference between yeah. all i have to learn a different range of motion for every set of strings in a sense yeah. whereas if i do this and i can move the mechanism there's some slight adjustments but it's it's not as drastic yes. so that's something to consider um uh uh and and if you're playing if you're playing you know <laughs> I, I, I can't like not move the mechanism because I work right. so hard learning how to do it. It's just, or, or I, I, I've seen some of the guys, uh, Hadrian, Ferro, and a bunch of those guys, and I always wonder why people didn't go, yeah, yeah, play that way. And if you play with a light touch, you can play that way with your thumb, and it doesn't sound out of place. If you play, and you switch to, it just sounds anemic. So, so learning to. Uh, to develop some headroom in your right hand allows these other techniques to come in. Because on one hand, playing hard and aggressive is, is just cool as it can be. It's got a vibe. It's got a sound. Just like yelling has a place, you know, at a ball game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in an intimate conversation with your wife or a 
or a deer <laughs> or a funeral or something. Yeah, Sounds yeah. Like, yeah, it probably isn't. Yeah. Really <laughs> <good. laughs> so <laughs> it's probably a little extreme analogy there, but but Gary, uh, or here's the way I explain it, and I'm pretty sure I probably stole this from from Willis or most of it. If zero is making no sound, and ten would be breaking a string. Yeah. Uh, nine would be the proverbial blood blister. Yeah, yeah. Eight is what I call splat, where you where where it almost sounds like you're popping. Yeah. Um, that that's it. So once you get to seven, you can be loud without splat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the practical range is kind of between one, playing really super light and barely getting any finger into it, and seven. Yeah. So where where do you think we should aim touch wise for our right hand to give us some headroom? Well, logically, I'm thinking about f- between four and five somewhere in there. Mm, yeah. So I can get. Then you've got four. some headroom then. Yeah, I, I can get a little louder before it gets caustic. Now, caustic is fine for an effect, but not as a means to an end. Yeah. For me, anyway, I w- I wouldn't want to play a ballad that way. No. No. So, and th- th- just on that to- um, topic, um, when I first started out, I I never played through an amp. I just used to play acoustically all the time. Yeah. And I'd be playing a lot of rock stuff and I'd be hammering away, you know, like bang, 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 because I couldn't hear myself. And it became apparent very quickly when I started playing through an amp that that just wasn't going to sound very nice for a start. It just was, and especially like you say, playing a ballad, it's just not going to work. And I had to consciously pull back. Now, one thing that I've, I keep telling students at the moment, and it's based on something that both Gary Willis and Jeff Berlin talk about a lot, and that's to do with sustain. And I'm sure that you the, you know, this is something you talk about as well, that if people want sustain, it's better to play lighter and turn up because you're just going to get a much, much longer sustain. And, and it's one of those things that people don't realize that they're, they're like, oh, I'm going to buy a compressor, buy a compressor to try and get more sustain. It's like, no, just play lighter. What, play lighter? And it's like, yeah. No, you're, you're, you're exactly right. And, and, and it, it, I, it's probably hard to see because this is a – you see the one knob? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I got it the way I want it. And, yeah. uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is, by the way, this is a Muckleroy bass built by Brady Muckleroy in Austin, Texas. Yeah, it's Six beautiful. Grade, eight and a half pounds, uh, three-piece maple neck, ebony fingerboard, 32-inch scale. Oh, man. Eight yeah. and a now, half pounds. Back, you, you can see this. I got two. My B and E string goes through the back of the body. So I get, so rather than being 32 inch scale and I got a, 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 a wimpier B string that oh, adds, man. it adds another inch and a half, two inches. So my B and E have a little more tension. tension in yeah. them. So this, this B. Oh yeah. There's no flap on it. Yeah, there's no flap on this at all. And the E is just a beast. And uh, these are uh, Kent Armstrong active pickups. Yeah. Uh, um, This is, uh, uh, they're active, but I have a push-pull so I can go passive if I want. Yeah. And and I I play through the the Aguilar, the SL-112s, the the light ones, because I don't carry anything heavy anymore. I had back surgery almost three years ago. I don't carry anything heavy. Me too. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing really well. I actually had successful back surgery. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Anyway, but I have the, the new AG700, which is a lovely amplifier. Uh, and there's a lot of good amplifiers, but I, I'm, I'm partial to the Aguilar folks. Um, and man, this, this thing sounds like a million freaking dollars. I, I mostly set that thing flat. Yeah. If I want to get, if I want to get... Now I have to have touch to play here and not get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And have that, but I can also go from. Yeah, it's like having a compressor. <laughs> now, when I'm going to solo and play a, a line or two. I'm back here by the bridge and my sound gets brighter. 
And so I can get that playing back here and I can get medium and I can change my sound musically, frankly, enough plenty during a, a song yeah. from where I put place my right hand. Yeah. So I tend to, not always. Uh, there, there, I mean, if I'm playing R&B stuff, I'm going to play back here because I want it because I want it to bite a little more. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. But man, I can make all the changes I need primarily with this, and I don't have all the knobs. Uh, uh, my my last several bases that I, that Jozan made me were brilliant, but the knobs, I this is just me. I'm not telling anybody else to do me. This is just, me. but. I always liked everything in the notch in the middle. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> I have everything flat. I leave everything flat and I move my hand to change yeah. myself. If I need more than that, I'll adjust it at the amplifier. And I keep, I keep saying to people that that moving the right hand, you can make your bass sound like a different bass, Thank but you. You, you know, you could, you can do more with that than you ever can with EQ. You know, you you can turn up the bass, you can turn up the treble, but you're still dealing with the same timbre. Whereas when you change where the hand moves, the timbre actually changes. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're exact. Thank you, thank you, my friend. I I hope I wasn't preaching something that you you teach just the opposite. Other no, oh, this is no. I, I I can't stress that but, enough. But what happened to me and Brady Muckleroy, who makes these instruments, uh, uh. He calls it gig bag tone. So every once in a while, a knob would get bumped in the, in the gig bag, taking it out. And I'd play part of the, like the first year for a sense going, oh, everything just sounds wrong. What the hell? Yeah. And I, Cause I never touched the knob. I only use the volume knob. Yeah. And all of a sudden I realized it got bumped. It drive me crazy. You yeah. Know? So I said, I just want a volume knob. And I said, will you make this for me like that? He goes, yeah, absolutely. So my next one, my next one I'm going to have him build probably in a, about another year i'll probably have him make me another one but but uh i'll probably go with something a little more i might have a second knob or a third i might have i thought you were going to say that you were going to have no volume control <laughs> just have a switch on and off i'd be tempted to but uh uh, uh no I, I i might go i might have one that's just this I, i'm on the fence with it but uh probably i don't know i don't know what i'm going to do I, I don't know what i'm going to do for lunch so, yeah yeah so let alone a year from now when I order another instrument, I'll get one a different color, and but it'll be the same basic. Thing, Beautiful. About eight, eight and a half pounds. And, and is that 26 frets? 26 fret, yeah. Man. Yeah. Do you know what? I'm so tempted because today I was transcribing a, a solo, a Dexter Gordon solo, and oh, nice. there was one bit. And I was playing it up here. I should have played it down here, really, but I was playing it up here. And all I needed, I think it was an, it might have been an A flat that I needed. It was on four string. And I was like, ah, oh, there's so many times when I just need an A or an A flat. And I'm like, ah, oh. I'm thinking, oh, I could do harmonics or something. But yeah, that would well, be so the, useful. The reason I went to 26 frets, uh, uh, when Joe was building my last uh, instruments for me, um, because I, I'm not a thumb slapper. I, I can do a little bit of it. I did my fair share in the 80s playing pop music, but I was never like what all you guys do. You guys are all just like machine gun fire. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, but never use it on gigs. <laughs> well, and, and that was the thing. I just used enough of it to, to play in the pocket and just do what I needed to do. And, and, uh, and, and that was enough for me. And then when I kind of became mostly a full-time jazz guy, uh, uh, I just kind of abandon it. I, I, when I hear it done tastefully and well, I'm all for it. It, it, it does tend to become overdone. Yeah. I, I'm sure you heard plenty of it last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, but, and, and I think it's great, but do it tastefully. And then please learn to play some notes, learn some, yeah, yeah. <laughs> learn some music. Um, but because I don't do that, I said, I said, you know, uh, you could, put a ramp up here for me because i like the feel of it yeah and he goes you know if you wanted to i could put a couple more notes because you don't use that area and i yeah. said oh you give me more notes i'll play them but i said but you got to give me access through the through the uh the cutaway yeah which is nice because i could i mean i can get all, i got access to all this stuff 
Yeah. So I like his design. You know, Brady is a phenomenal player himself. He he really can play. It's not very nice. Yeah. He'll hurt your feelings if he plays so <laughs> but he's a, And so there's so much intelligent design. It's not fancy. It's not furniture. Yeah. I mean, he can make furniture for you, but but yeah. but, uh, but it's a beautiful it, base. He's a guy who really, really knows how to play, and so those things you go, oh yeah, no, this makes sense. This is the kind of stuff that working guys want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and it's I eight believe, and a half pounds. Eight and a half pounds. Yeah, I mean, it's a wonder, six and, string and it, that's eight and a half pounds, <laughs> and it, and it just it just sits there like that. It, oh, the balance man. is just phenomenal, and. Uh, I thought I'd done well finding an eight and a half pound precision, let alone a six string. Yeah. Um, I have this this bad boy here. Check this out. This is my I call this my teaching base. Yeah. This is my four string that Brady built. Now it's just passive Aguilar's, you know, straight ahead uh, volume, pan tone. Anyway, this is six point eight pounds. <sighs> What's it made of? Spun. It's like a balsa wood base, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just and it's so comfortable, and it, it actually it really sounds great. And it, you know, it's if a I short was, scale, thirty-two inch scale. I I I'm a thirty-two inch scale guy. They have thirty-two inch scale hands. It, it's deceiving with the camera. If I yeah. hold them back here, you go, oh yeah, he's got he's got got like junior. Uh, it's, I look like it's hands on a, of a junior high school kid. You know? <laughs> so so. Uh, Anyway, that's the uh, – so, so this, this is – I love this little bass. And so when I'm teaching four stringers, they're not so – oh Yeah, yeah, yeah. Six string all the time. And, 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 and it's marvelous. Uh, I'm uh, – Is I'm that a signature to... model that he actually does for people or is it just a custom one that you had built? Well, th this is kind of one of his, his basic design. And, and, and I just said, well, I want an ebony fingerboard. I want 32-inch scale. I want big, giant dots. For yeah. me and for teaching, because I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good idea. One, -on -one online, and uh, and uh, uh, he built me a ramp, and uh, uh, my friend Mr. Lee built me a ramp for that, and uh, so I, I, I'm. Uh, it, it's just real functional and real happy. So, you know, if I'm teaching five six hours in a day or something, mm. man, you know, I'm physically comfortable on gigs because I play lighter instruments, and then the sustain out of that. Six string, it's just, it's goofy, you know. Yeah. You know, your um, back surgery, was it, uh, I, I mean, I say this um, as someone that's had in, immense problems with my back from playing. Um, did, um, was it, a, was it from playing bass, do you think? No, so it was from uh, uh, <laughs> uh, sports injuries from high school. I got thrown off a horse a couple of times, landed on my tailbone. Mine was L5 at the L4 and L5 at the bottom of the back. Okay. And, and so I got low bridge playing basketball and you fall down and hit my head. People tell you that's led to some problems, but landed on the tailbone and bruised my tailbone several times. When you're a kid, you recover, you feel great. And then you get yeah. into your fifties yeah. and, and those old injuries calcify. So in my spine, the MRI is supposed to look like this, where your 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 spine there's like a little white O-ring between the the vertebrae and your spine, and mine looked like this oh, at L4 hell. and L5 because it had just was full of calcification. Yeah, and so it was pinching my spine and it was pinching my sciatic nerve, and I got to where I, I I could I could walk, but it really hurt. I could only walk for about two minutes. Could only stand and talk to you for sixty seconds. I had to sit down. And it, it was crippling, and so they they uh, uh, they went in and they and I and I did yoga, and 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 I, I've been working with a trainer for four years, uh, three days a week just to strengthen my core and 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 everything and and keep my career. Thankfully, because I I don't play too hard, I play light instruments. This all the money making stuff is hanging in there. My my right. back gets tired, and we all sit like this, you know. Yeah, it's just, yeah the instrument but but uh, i'm working on that trying to get my my trainers always going to pull those shoulders back and all yeah that. but but uh they literally go in and they call it a roto rooter you know and they go in there and they just clean all that stuff out and got a sexy little one inch scar that it's minimally invasive and and uh how and much it, recovery time was it it took me about four mu I, I i i was off work for about two months and then i went back 
and I just had to be real careful. And uh, they told me, oh, in four months, you'll be good as new. They lie. They <laughs> like, it, it, took a, it took a good solid year. Right. And then the second year, I, I, or the next, the next six months is where I really, really made a bunch of improvement, finally. But I, I've been put in the work three days a week with a trainer, supervised, you know, a lot of core work, a lot of squats, you know, uh, sensible stuff. But they, those, I got a couple of lady trainers that just kick my butt all over the place. But I can walk now. I can hike upwards of seven miles out all around Arizona, which we love to do. And and I'm I'm a I, I can stand up on gigs. Yeah. Uh, I didn't stand up on a gig for five years. You know, unless yeah. I was getting up to go to the bathroom or to go home. Yeah. You know? And. Uh, um, and and uh, now I now I, I sit sometimes because I play with we're all old so everybody sits and then I'll stand up for solos or or if I'm playing a melody or leading the band I'll stand up a little bit more but but I'm very comfortable playing man if you'd have yeah. had a heavy bass that would have been a nightmare nightmare yeah yeah. I, yeah I used to be an, a Yamaha endorser and I they made me this beautiful like pink if you go back in the archives you see me playing like a pink reddish yes yeah, yeah. I had a MIDI pickup and i was doing a bunch of cool stuff with that and and it was 35 inch skill and that thing it sounded great it's like the patty tucci one yeah it destroyed my rotator cuff i got yeah. up one day and i couldn't lift my arm my rotator cuff was so inflamed from trying to play all these chords with small hands on that big thing so I had some physical problem. There was like a little crack in the neck that they needed to repair. So they loaned me like a regular 34 inch scale and my symptoms started going away. I go, I'm never playing 35 again. Yeah. And that's when I switched to Zahn and he made me 34s and that was cool. And then in my travels, just going around, I played a, a 33 and a 32 inch scale. And it was like, you know, when Cinderella puts on the, the, the ruby slipper or whatever yeah, yeah. it was, you know, and it was just like, oh, or like I, I picked up a 32 inch scale and went, it was like putting on a tailor made suit. Yeah. And I just went, okay. And so I, I switched to 32 and unless my hand, my fingers grow, I'm probably never going back. You know? I think also the worry for people is that when they think about going down to, um, short scale they think that there's going to be some strange like like all the bass is going to disappear from the instrument and that but it's not at all i i feel like brady and i really hit a smart thing what what 32 takes away it also gives back especially with the six string this is just my opinion but i also have ears and, and i you can kind of hear it and you can feel it if you play it yeah. but if I just went through the bridge here, I, the B and E string would, would not have near the tension, but coming through the body and adding an extra inch and a half, it's right around 33 and a half as far as from he, from back here, you know, uh, that, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. So, so it's got more tension. I don't know how that works. I've had some people say, well, how can that be? And that? I don't know. I, I can't count past 13. So I don't know the math, but you play it and you go, well, yeah, that feels really good. Yeah. I, I can put it in through the regular bridge and it feels, it feels pretty good. Put it mm. to the back. You go, it just feels better. Okay. Now what, so the, the B and E string tend to like a longer, a longer scale. The G and the C do not. Yeah. The C definitely does not. And so, so the minute, being a six string player, I feel like we fooled this instrument into improving the B and E enough where you go. That's yeah. Fine. And then it also gives me. Yeah. Like, like. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's a lot of, for, uh, for a non-composite neck instrument, for a wood neck instrument, that's amazing high-end sustain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's so, like a hybrid, like a, you know, like now that you've got the, or like a little bit, like I suppose a bit like what dingwalls go for with the fan frets, yeah. but, uh, but without fan frets. Fan fret, I, I think, is a great idea. And, and if, I put, if I was a, only a one note at a time bass player, Man, it makes there's an awful lot of smart things behind it, and it's mm. very comfortable. But yeah. when you start trying to play chords, it yeah, shoots in the foot. Tough. That's the only problem with that for me. But, but yeah. I feel like at least for now, this is the best of 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 the 
the possible worlds. At least for me, I feel like I got a really good, solid B&E. And everybody goes, damn, the bottom end on that thing is killing me. It's just, uh, it's so warm. And, and you just got all, you know, bottom end for days. And yet the, the high end is soft and sustainable and warm and clear. And, and so I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with it. I'll put it, a link it, to it. For me, this, is, this is ideal. Well, you know, it looks ideal for me, to be honest. And I think, um, especially with all the, the lightweight thing, because I'm a real big advocate of having lighter gear. And I've had arguments with people about this because... You know, yeah, you know why? Because you're over 40 now. Well, this is it. I know. I know as soon as I hit 40, it was like, oh. But you know what? The musicians are, are so terrible for, for themselves, you know. They, they cause problems for themselves because I was talking to someone about this. The other, I think it was Michael Mondesi I was talking to. We were um, talking about going to gigs. You know, what's, what happened? You get a bunch of musicians in a van or something like that and you drive for miles, hours and hours and hours to a gig. You get to the gig, what's the first thing that you do? You open up the thing and you start pulling out all these amps, you know, heavy amps, racks, you know, taking them through crazy little get-ins and stuff like this. And then no warm-up. If you were lifting that kind of gear in a gym, you'd do a warm-up. Not musicians. We just get the stuff out and just, you know, no warm-ups or anything. And it's, and it's heavy gear. And, I mean, I, I won't bore you with the details, but I, I, I had really bad uh, back issues from just playing lots and lots of sets with very heavy instruments. And it yeah. over the years, you know, you do it for a while. And... You know, you don't really think about it that much. You think, oh, my shoulder's hurting a bit, you know, and that kind of thing. Year after year after year, yeah. and you start, oh, I'm standing up. Oh, I'm having to stretch out a little bit more. Before you know it, you, you bent like this. And I had to go and have all these, all this physio, you know, like uh, yoga, Pilates, all, all of that stuff. And gave me all these yeah. exercises. Thankfully, I'm really, really, um, I'm, I'm good now. But um, ever since... Like when I ever hear anybody say, nah, you don't want light instruments, you don't want light amps, you want a big amp SVT and you want a massive big, you know, P bass that weighs 15 pounds, a limbic. And, and I'm like, man, you just try doing like gigs every single night with that set after set, you are going to kill yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, every time. Hey, um, uh, what, one thing I would encourage everyone, one of the reasons I, I had back surgery the main reason was just old sports injuries and falling off a horse. That was the, the main thing. But the other thing is, is, I know this now, but from the time I'm 30 to 45, 15 years, I sat on my ass and practiced eight hours a day. I, 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 act, I, 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 I wasn't active enough. Now, at a certain point, you, you, Quincy Jones calls it ass power. You sit your ass in the chair and you get to work and there's power in that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so uh, uh, but, and, and I worked things out and I learned to play chords and I'd learned to be a better music, yada, yada, yada. I, I, I had to practice a lot to improve. Yeah. We all have to put in time. There's no shortcut for that. But I would encourage anyone, at, really at any stage, but if you're a younger guy and you're the late teens or twenties or thirties, you know, you're 10 feet tall and made of steel, but when you get to be 45, your body goes, yeah, you know, and, and, and you sat on your ass and practice a lot, but you didn't stretch me and you didn't walk me and yeah. you didn't do enough of that. So I would encourage everybody to, to find some uh, balance implies 50, 50. Yeah. So find a proportion of exercise in your day as often as you can get it. And for your longevity, it's going to be key. And, and remember, it, we're not like sports stars that are done when they're 40 for the most yeah. part, you know, for the, 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 the major sports and stuff like that. Obviously, you can play golf and bowl. Yeah. And do, yeah, yeah. You know, I like to hike and we, we're getting into kayaking and really doing yeah. that. But, but as a musician, man, you start having an idea of what the hell you're doing when you hit 40. Yeah, and we can play till the day we die. Uh, I, I've seen. I mean, you can you hear some of the old jazz masters. They're in their eighties and yeah. still they they can barely get around. But man, they can still play. Ray Brown was going right to the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, so so I would encourage everybody to seek that out. You know, uh, you know, try to eat clean. 
eat a little less processed food, watch your alcohol consumption and stuff yeah. like that. It sounds like such a cliche, doesn't it? But it's like such an important thing. It's such an important thing, and uh, um, nobody so, focuses yeah. on it. Everybody focuses on the on the on the the instrument and the and the music and all of that stuff, which is great. But it, th- that other stuff can literally put an end to your career, you know. Put an end to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah. well, Todd, that was absolutely fantastic. And uh, where can everybody find you, um, Todd? johnsonmusic.com that's my website it's going to get a big overhaul um uh, here pretty soon it's pretty old school but we'll, we'll get it updated um uh um i, I teach a whole bunch of uh, online private lessons uh, mm-hmm. via zoom which we're using right now yeah. which i really love um and uh, i have students all over the world and uh, uh and you can send me an email at todd at toddjohnsonmusic.com and if somebody wants to study with me or something, uh, uh, I, I, I'm always taking on students and, uh, and be thrilled to help you. I have organized methods and all that stuff. And, yeah. And, uh, so uh, would love to do it. Six stringers, you know, we can get into all the. all that kind of fun stuff to get into and, and well brilliant um yeah i'll put all the details down in the info below so people can check that out and uh yeah thanks a lot todd <laughs>